Sister Sati. <laughs> White stripes. Thank you. Thank you. That's the Ravens uh, psych em up song here in Baltimore. You should see here the whole Ravens stadium chanting that. I know that some other teams in the country have picked that up, but started here. Um, well, welcome to the last morning. Um, I hope everyone has been having um, a good morning and the breakout sessions. I stuck my head and listened to a few. Things seem to be uh, pretty, pretty good. I want to point out a couple of things before we get started. First of all, um, you know that we have a number of tours and, and activities this afternoon, and if you've signed up for those, you should have gotten an email giving you some information. But if you've signed up and didn't get an email, or if you still want to sign up, there are a few, few slots left. Go to the registration table out by the, uh, when you come in off the elevators and, and make sure you sign up. The other thing I want to mention, you see the slide behind me, um, uh, coming up in May, uh, we're going to try to get businesses and NGOs up to visit uh, in Congress to talk about climate action. Um, and we would welcome anybody who has been motivated and inspired to take more action from uh, the work that's been going on here in the last couple of days, that if you want to find a way to participate at a at a level that really uh, um, is uh, part of our vibrant democracy, uh, you know, sign up or, or find uh, more information out at the EDF table uh, outside, and there's other folks that are involved. So I, I, I hope that uh, those, some of you will be uh, so moved and, and start to really see how you can make a difference. So to start us off this morning, um, I'm very excited uh, to, uh, to uh, introduce Jean-Christophe Flatin, who is the president of Innovation, Science, Technology, and Mars Edge. Um, Jean-Christophe leads Mars, Mars Edge, which is a, a segment of, the, of Mars dedicated to human nutrition. And he also heads up the innovation agenda that includes oversight of the quality of food, safety, as well as Mars Advanced Research Institution. And he's been with Mars since 1992 um, in, in many different capacities. I, I think those of you who were with us last night know that uh, Mars won the Organizational Leadership Award. And you know, to get an Organizational Leadership Award, it requires a, a full cultural um, commitment in the company to the kinds of change and the kinds of actions uh, that really make a difference. And so achievements that we looked at uh, from Mars included improved land use methods, measures for more accurately assessing emission impacts, helping launch the renewable thermal collaborative, you know, born out of their own needs to look at their thermal impacts, and participating in new corporate leadership platform to diagnose business climate risk. You'll note from the rain yesterday, we have leaks in the building, potentially a climate risk. Um, so I think the, the, the organizational commitment really comes from all of the leadership in the, in the company. And so I'm really excited to invite Jean-Christophe up here. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the music. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much, Bob. I uh, want to start by uh, thanking the Center for Climate and Clean Energy Solutions, the Climate Registry, and Bloomberg Philanthropies for putting this great and crucial and necessary event together. Uh, the, question I, the fundamental question I want to address with you is, why are, why are we here? Why does that matter? Why are we doing what we do that you guys were kind enough to uh, recognize through the awards that just Bob just talked about? And of course, the cynics in you could start with the first level answer, saying those guys care because climate change impacts, potentially disrupts 
their operations and value chain. And by the way, that's true. Just in the past two years, in the US, in Asia, in other parts of the world, hurricanes, extreme heat, drought, flooding, fires, typhoons in Asia have certainly seriously disrupted our operations. No longer than three weeks ago in Australia, due to extreme heat, we had to stop our Wodonga factory because the extreme heat impact on electricity availability and to be frank on electricity price had us to stop production for an entire two days. And even if you look on the longer term, climate change impact has a very serious impact on crops, crops yield, as well as diseases, both in crops and livestock. So yes, all of that is true. Climate and climate change already has a very serious impact disrupting our operations and supply chains. But that's not enough. We are here for much more. We are here because of a burning duty and a unique opportunity. And let me start with a burning duty. Very simply, we are the first generation of citizens and leaders who won't be able to say we didn't know. We know. The science is here, the facts, the data are here. And even more, if further proof was needed, or could we make the point even clearer, the latest IPCC 1.5 degree report has made things even clearer. So our generation won't be able to go away with we didn't know. And that creates a unique duty. Duty to whom, you could ask? Duty to our children. Duty to our employees. We call them associates at Mars. 120,000 of them. Duty to the next generation and the future talents. They are all asking the question to us. And which stronger motivation, honestly, do we need that having your kids looking at you in the eyes, and trust me, mine do that, and asking the burning question, what are you doing? You gave birth to me, you brought me to life, and you're sacrificing my future? What are you doing to prevent that? As we speak, kids, youngs, teenagers, young adults, march across the street, across the world, with this burning question to all of us. What are we doing? And together with this burning duty comes a unique opportunity. Mars is a privately owned, family owned company. We have global footprint, and we are lucky to have brands and products that millions love across the world. If you think of our confectionery, you may have heard of M&Ms and sneakers, and not only the M&Ms that are or have been on your table. We are also very active in pet food, brands with pedigree, Whiskas, Walken Inn, as well as in food with Uncle Ben's. So we have scale. But thanks to the long-term thinking that private ownership offers us, we have a unique opportunity. And this is to forge, to innovate solutions that require long-term thinking. And this is where the opportunity joins the duty. What does it look like? In 2017, we publicly announced our sustainable in a generation plan. And that's our opportunity, to think and act in generations. This plan was pretty comprehensive, first with a very strong, unique ambition that was recognized yesterday evening, which is for the first time we made a commitment that our emissions on our full value chain would be reduced by two-thirds by 2050. 
full value chain, not the little comfortable perimeter of our factories. We know that an ambition without resources is meaningless. So we have put an initial investment of $1 billion on the table for that. And finally, without the right behaviors, you don't drive change. So myself and my fellow leaders, colleagues, we are all incentivized on our long-term incentive measured by our greenhouse gas emissions. Even more concretely, if you zoom in renewable energy and you look at renewable electricity, we've made a further commitment which is within our direct impact is to have 100% renewable electricity by 2040. The news I have for you today is in 2018, we have passed the 50% mark. We already have 50% of our electricity that is coming from renewable sources, which means in 10 countries in the world, and not the smallest one, including US, UK, Australia, Mexico, 100% of our electricity consumed in our operation come from renewable sources. Our team just come back from Yucatan, Mexico, where for the first time in Yucatan, a wind farm is operating. This could not have been made possible without decades-long commitment. But thanks to this decades-long commitment we put on the table, we offer the foundation for developers to start a project that others have then joined. They managed to gather the financing, the funding they needed to put that. And as a side but super crucial consequence, we are now offering communities alternative sources of electricity. So this is what long-term thinking and long-term commitment can do. And this is for the energy part, but I shared with you the goal. Our goal requires that we look much beyond renewable energy. There is another fundamental humanity challenge at stake that some people do not relate to climate change, that we relate to climate change. As humanity, we will need to find a way to feed 10 billion individuals with a much lower carbon footprint. And the reason why this matters is because we can already witness that the most vulnerable population to climate change are very often also the most vulnerable to food security. These are two legs of a joint problem. So how to do that? How to work on that? Agriculture in our carbon footprint analysis is the biggest driver of our emissions. So we need to work on that. And therefore, working on yield on nutrition makes total sense. It's not a distinct subject. This is the same subject. Let me give you two examples. The first example, talking about yield, is our Cocoa for Generations program. We are one of the largest cocoa buyers in the world, so cocoa matters tremendously. And the beauty of that, the point I'm trying to make through this example, this is a holistic sustainability approach. When you raise, when you contribute to raise the yield for smallholder farmers of cocoa, you improve their livelihood, you lower the carbon footprint, and you diminish the undue pressure on natural forests. All of that is linked. And in terms of nutrition, the division I lead called Mars Edge, our passion is empowering people to live fuller lives through targeted nutrition. One of our first products is now live in the market in India. It's a product called Gomo. And this product has the ambition to help closing the nutritional gap of school-aged children in India between 6 and 18 years old. So yes, nutrition is also on the agenda. So why am I sharing that? I'm sharing that to share with you that creating the change is possible. But I'm not preaching, I'm not teaching. I'm sharing that with you because I know we are a like-minded group. But you need to know as well that we come to that 
we share this with you with an extreme humility. This is a very, very humbling journey with many stumbles. So no one organization can stand up and say, we own the truth, we've cracked the solution. We are here because we need your help, because we need your partnerships. This challenge requires very uncommon collaborations. And we are lucky to have some of our dear partners in the room, WRI, WWF, Navigant, and many others. We need you. We need your energy. We need your challenge, your kick in the butt when we're not doing the right thing or not right enough. And we need your collective intelligence to bring things to life. Because this problem is much too large and complex so that anyone can solve it alone. So in summary, this is, we are at a unique point of time. In 2002, one of the former French presidents, Jacques Chirac, in Johannesburg, in the, in, at the Hearst summit, had this famous quote talking about climate change. Our house is burning and we look somewhere else. At Mars, we've chosen to fight the flames. We cannot afford to ignore the burning house. First, because we see that large multinationals, when you embrace the reality and you think long term, we can have an impact. But also because we truly believe that the world we want tomorrow Start with how we do business today. So, to all of you in the room, let's join forces. Let's join our energy, our ideas, our collective intelligence. Our children are looking at us. And we cannot afford to wait. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Christophe, for getting us, getting us off to such a compelling start this morning. Um, good morning, everybody. So nice to see all of you on a Friday. Um, I am delighted to introduce our next session, uh, which is a conversation with and between climate leaders. In fact, all four of our panelists and their organizations uh, are 2019 Climate Leadership Award winners. Um, and on that note, uh, I just wanted to say it's so amazing to see so many of you come out and support and celebrate all of our winners last night. So thank you. We hope you enjoyed yourselves as much as we did. Um, we know it's day three of the conference, it's a Friday, it's the morning after the awards, you're all going back to your real lives and your, your real jobs this afternoon. So we want to spend the next 30 minutes sharing stories, ideas, uh, and giving a little bit of inspiration to take away with you. Um, so with no further ado, please join me in welcoming back to the stage Jean-Christophe Flatin, Jean-Christophe Flatin, President of Innovation, Science, Technology, and Mars Edge at Mars Incorporated, as well as Nancy Sutley, Chief Sustainability Officer at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and this year's Individual Leadership Award winner, Doug Huxley, Climate Change Practice Leader from CH2M Now Jacobs, and last but not least, fresh off our panel this morning, Noura Singh, Director of Sustainability at PepsiCo. So good morning to all of you and congratulations. Um, Jean-Christophe, to pick up where you left off, you just talked about businesses having a duty to act on climate change uh, and, in doing, and doing so in a way that promotes mutual benefits. Can you talk a little bit more about that idea of, of mutuality and what that means in the corporate sector? Thank you. Um, mutuality has been part of the Mars principles, um, funny enough, since 1947. Uh, being a family company, family members impact a lot the story. And in 1947, Forrest Mars Sr. wrote an internal note that is still famous and on our walls today, uh, saying that there is no enduring benefits uh, if this benefit is not mutually shared. And he was in a quite visionary manner at this time, already declaring that it needed to be shared much beyond the usual stakeholders, and it needed to encompass competitors, 
customers, suppliers, communities, employees, associates. So this fast forward where we are has translated into our internal think tank producing a new business model innovation called Economics of Mutuality. And I invite you guys to look at a book called Completing Capitalism. The thinking is taking the triple bottom line from the 90s where we were looking separately at return on financial capital, return on environmental capital, and return on social and human capital, and saying we cannot afford to look at them separately anymore. They need to be part of one mutual PL, because that's the only way that you bring the tensions to life. And we already have 55 pilots within Mars, as I speak, where we are bringing to life this economics of mutuality principle. Thank you. So does that kind of philosophy resonate with, with your organizations, or do you have an alternative or a variation on that, Nancy? Well, I think uh, what's not unique about LADWP, but interesting about LADWP is we're owned by the people of Los Angeles. And so it's important that we reflect um, what the people of Los Angeles want and our political leaders, our, um, our community. Um, and I think that's, that's a philosophy that's always guided LADWP. Um, and so if you look at how uh, LADWP has, has um, evolved over the years, I mean, you know, 40 years ago, uh, we were burning oil in power plants and on the coast of, uh, of Los Angeles. Uh, they're now burning natural gas um, and that's, uh, that's on its way out. Um, we have goals to get to 100% renewable energy by 2045 and are right now studying how we do that. Um, so I, I think that, uh, that that's, some, that's a kind of an ethic I think that's important in this area is really about communicating with the public, um, getting the public engaged and involved, um, and, and, and reflecting back um, to the public, you know, what, what they want. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's made a huge difference uh, for us as we set goals. Um, you know, we, we, our board meetings are open to the public. They show up. Um, they've been showing up saying, you know, what are you doing to, to address the, the climate crisis? And, and, and it's important um, to respond and to respond in a way that meets um, all of the goals of the city uh, not just these environmental goals, but our economic and our social goals as well. Um, we have a million poor people in Los Angeles. We have to provide them the same uh, level of services and affordable prices as we do anybody else um, who lives in LA. So I, I, think, um, I think it's Im important for um, companies and agencies and members to really kind of look, you know, look internally and and express externally, um, and and really embrace what what's unique about each each of our organizations that can help move um, move us to where we need to be. Doug. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think with a, a company like Jacobs um, Engineering Construction Consulting, puts us in a little bit of a unique position compared to some of the other award winners and, and our other speakers today, and, and it's based on the on the on you know, the, the, the finite duration of our projects. We step in, we've got a month, six months, a year um, to make a difference on a, on a program. And we're expected to bring in that expertise. Um, and I, I think there's been some interesting questions raised um, about professional engineers and our obligations. Do, do we have the obligation, the, the legal obligation to consider climate change in our work? I, I certainly think it is. Maybe. Not all of my colleagues are quite convinced, but again, we're, you know, we, we step in, we bring unique perspectives, relationships um, to the table and, and perhaps solving problems, but then, then we're out six months later. So um, we're, you know, to, I think to, to effect change, um, you know, there, there's, there's several factors that have to come together. There has to be the right financial uh, environment and incentives we need new technologies, we need the expertise and know-how and the right regulatory structure. Well, well certainly as a, as a consultant or as an engineer, we touch on at least two or three of those, the technologies, the expertise. Um, you know, we do have the ability to, to help bring public-private finance 
to problems, so perhaps uh, addressing the, uh, the financial part of that. Regulatory, um, you know, we're, we, I, I think we try hard not to, um, uh, you know, step in in a policy, it's a little bit of a conflict of interest sometimes, but, but definitely, you know, it gives us a unique position um, to, to address some of these issues. Nora. Yeah, certainly. I think um, with uh, PepsiCo being uh, a very uh, consumer-focused um, company and consumer-facing company, um, the idea of mutuality and, and collaboration is, is very important to us. Um, and, and a lot of our, our goals um, uh, that we have currently um, as part of our, our overall sustainability commitment is about the entire value chain. And so we recognize that we sit in one place in the value chain, but the products that we make touch um, you know, a, a long chain upstream as well as downstream. And so thinking about that and thinking about the impacts that that creates, um, we understand that it's really important to then engage with our value chain, engage with our um, customers and consumers downstream, as well as our suppliers um, upstream, sometimes really upstream where um, it, it's difficult, um, where you, ha you, know, you increasingly have lower influence as you go, go up, upstream in your supply chain. Um, but, uh, but we understand that that's important. And so um, all of our sustainability commitments that we have we're continuously thinking about partnerships and collaboration, um, whether it's our agricultural supply chain, um, whether it's our um, uh, third-party logistics area, um, whether it's our packaging supply chain. Um, we're, we try to find common ground and, and areas of mutuality. Um, a lot of companies today, um, thankfully, have similar goals and, and similar um, uh, ideas that they're trying to achieve and bring to life. And so um, finding that common ground is getting um, increasingly um, easier, if you will, and important. And so um, the, you know, our principles, our, our goals, and, and our activities always um, have this underlying thread of mutuality and collaboration, and, and that's kind of how we, we work on the goals. So to pick up on that note of collaboration, a, a theme that seems to have percolated up throughout the conference, um, informally and formally, that the, the theme of community, the climate leadership community specifically, when you consider that we know, we, as you mentioned, Jean-Christophe, that we've only got a little over a decade to transform the way that we live and work. It's hard to conceive of that kind of, the kind of profound transformation we need to achieve without collective action, collective intelligence. So we've got two multinational corporations, a global engineering firm and, and uh, the largest municipal utility in the US represented on this stage. So I'm wondering about your, your thoughts and your ideas in terms of how we can move farther, faster, how we can ratchet up our level of ambition together. I'm happy to start. I would say three key words, act, share, and speak. Act, because if you don't lead by example, there is no way you can ask others to join or offer partnership, because that would be asking others what you're not doing yourself. So lead by exemplarity. Share, because this is a piece of knowledge that need and can be shared. So we have a few examples. I refer to our renewable energy and specifically electricity earlier, where we have shared with competitors what we have been doing. Because this type of knowledge is like love and affection. It does not diminish when you share it. It increases. And it's pretty rare in life, by the way. There are not so many examples. Friendship is probably one of the last ones. Um, so we do that. And, and we go to the PepsiCo, PNG, Nestle of this world, and we are very happy to share the way we've done that, what does a long-term commitment look like and how we have managed to foster a solution. And, and finally, speak, speak out. The, this issue is so complex and so overwhelming that it's very easy for people to miss that something is happening. And encouraging the movement starts by making visible what's happening and what's possible. Once again, certainly not in a teaching or preaching manner, but in a very humble manner. And the fact that we chose to raise our voice immediately in the we are still in movement belongs to that. So that nobody is hammered by fatality, but on the contrary, say, things are moving, some people are trying, let's join the movement. 
Sim. So, you know, I think, I think there's also um, you know, that idea of, of thinking beyond kind of what your, what your normal business is. So, you know, we produce electricity, we, we gather water and deliver it to, to people in Los Angeles. Um, but more and more we're looking at things like how do we, how do we electrify the transportation sector? Um, it's the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in California. It's you know, sort of largely unregulated entirely. Um, and as the grid gets cleaner and cleaner, the opportunity to clean up the transportation sector by electrifying it is, becomes more and more of a, a, a good idea. Um, and so, but we're not in the car business. Um, we're not in the bus business, uh, but we, we can help to enable that. So I think that, you know, that as we, um, you know, as we try to tackle this problem with the, with the sense of urgency that we need, it, it's important, I think, for us to get a kind of get out of our, feel comfortable about getting out of our lanes um, and, and, and thinking more expansively about how do we tackle this problem uh, working together. And so um, you know, we, uh, for example, just um, signed a memorandum of understanding where we'll help with the Port of Los Angeles, which is the you know, largest source of um, NOx emissions, so smart farming emissions in the Los Angeles basin um, that also has a zero emission goal for GHG emission goal for 2030. Um, they can't do it by themselves. They need us. Um, so we, we're developing that partnership, uh, working every day to make sure that we're delivering on that um, so that we can meet the goals um, and do it with urgency. That's great. Doug? All right. I think I, uh, how to accomplish more uh, faster, I, 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 to, me, to me, comes down a lot to the transfer of knowledge between industries, within industries, within companies. I, I, I think there's there's a lot of of pessimism or 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 feeling that that maybe this goal is not achievable. And I think we we've heard a lot here at this conference and, and elsewhere. Um, I you know I was I came away with a sense of optimism from the talk on Wednesday with the with the scenario analysis and seeing that. You know, 80% is achievable with current technology. So, so it's in our grasp. But, but we, you know, we need, you know, we need sharing uh, be, between between industries, um, and and you know, perhaps even even looking at ourselves within Jacobs. You know, there's maybe five percent of our 75,000 people that are really, you know, on top of of the climate issue. Maybe it's even less than that. To, but to, for us to be able to bring that thinking into every project, into into every action, um, there, there there there's a lot more that can be accomplished. So so again, right now, I think we we've got a silo. Um, you know, some industries. Uh, you know, there there there's there's clear leaders. And, um, I, I guess I'm thinking of, of, of uh, oil and gas here in particular. You know, some of the majors are clearly out in front of some of these issues. A lot of more of those mid-sized and smaller companies are still rooted, you know, in, in the denial or in, you know, there's no way we can address this without bankrupting the company. So the, 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 more, the more we're able to share information, the faster we'll move along. Nora. Yeah, I think um, for me it's the the thought of sort of um, all of us working together for the greater good, and I'm kind of going to go back to the panel yesterday talking about pre-competitive collaboration. And um, within the sustainability space, I think it's very common for companies to come together to work on an issue because all of us recognize that these are massive issues that um, we need to make transformative change for, and so we can't do it alone. Um, I think in terms of, I think, faster, um, sometimes it feels like, you know, multi-stakeholder collaborations don't move as fast as you would like to. Um, and as a, as a company, you always want to move fast, and sometimes if they're not moving fast, you get a little frustrated. Um, but then if you think about the, the bigger and the greater impact, you know that you need those, and you need to, to sit down with your peers and, and with... Um, uh, stakeholders to be able to do this. I think for PepsiCo, um, recycling is a great example where we have a lot of work going on that is about the industry and trying to lift up the industry. And so 
you know, we're investing in work that is about uh, creating better recycling infrastructure within um, various markets. And so it's about working with the industry. It's about investing in those infrastructure. It won't happen overnight, but over time, it'll create a greater impact. Thank you. Nancy Settler, I'm going to put you in the spotlight for a minute. I, I'm not going to lie, what I'd really like to ask you about is your purple Schwinn bike with the banana seat, but I, I, will, I will refrain. It was very cute. <laughs> And that's going to say, I'm just realizing that probably makes no sense to you because no. you weren't here last night, but I'll explain it later. Um, so you've uh, worked at the city level. You've led the uh, White House Council on Environmental Quality. You've been to COPS. Um, what has been a defining moment for you? Um, what's the thing that's given you the greatest sense of optimism? You know, I, I think it's this idea that, you know, we can all work together and, and solve problems. And, um, and it's really about getting down to it and doing the work. And um, so, you know, whether it's, um, as I mentioned last night, you know, you look at Los Angeles today, um, the sky is cleaner than it's been, you know, um, forever. Uh, and it's, you know, the air is healthier to breathe and, and not because, you know, somebody may, waved a magic wand. It was a lot of work. Um, but it also, I think, and this is, you know, part of what gives me hope is, you know, if you look at the last 40 years um, in L.A., um, you know, it, it's one of the most important economies in the U.S. Um, if Los Angeles County... Uh, was a country, you know, it would be, I forget, what, like eighth or tenth or something largest economy in the world. Um, and we did all that. We've had these really impressive levels of economic growth um, and population growth, and we've reduced you know, smog to levels um, that you haven't seen probably in 80 years. Um, so I, I just, I think that it's about you know taking the taking the problem seriously, understanding the, the urgency, um, applying the the technological solutions and the and the economic, social, and cultural solutions to help to help solve a, a problem. Um, and you know when it goes to um, you know can you can you create you know sort of collaboration. Um, among disparate parts of, of society to get this stuff done. Um, sorry to go, keep going back to the air pollution example. So the first air pollution monitor uh, in Los Angeles uh, was on top of a DWP building. Um, the, uh, back in the 1940s, the LA County Air Pollution Control Agency put, put its first monitor. It's still there. I think the equipment has changed. Um, but, but there's, you know, so that level of collaboration now goes back generations. Um, and, and I think that, um, that what, what sort of, and I've seen this throughout my career where, um, the, the power of an individual to make change is, is important, but the power of a group of people working together, um, overcoming their silos, um, as we were just talking about, um, really does uh, help to drive change, and and I think that sort of clarity of purpose, um, and and being able to see, um, you know, the results. Uh, I think really, you know, it can be applied to the climate crisis as it can be to so many other things. Yeah. Doug, what's giving you hope and inspiring you? I, I think I answer that question from a personal perspective and maybe a little bit less as a you know representative of you know having helped our, our company reduce its footprint i've been doing uh, greenhouse gas consulting for uh, for close to 20 years now um, and when i started i was doing a lot of uh, air quality permitting especially psd for electric power um, you can be sure i was pretty careful where i handed out a business card that said climate change on it um, you know, there, um, you know, there, there was there was certainly an art to to, to having that conversation and, and not getting into the science debate, but keeping it focused on business and, and progress. You know, that's uh, um, that that's not quite such a challenge anymore. 
and 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 again from the personal perspective, I, you know, one one thing that that stands out pretty pretty clear in my memory, um, we we were working on a big program with uh, coastal wetlands and carbon offsets, and I and I came back from a business trip and was was uh, was pretty excited about where we're going, and I'm, and I'm standing on the uh, on the baseball field at my son's little league, shagging fly balls during practice, and I mentioned this to somebody else, and the and the contempt and the disdain that he turned, carbon offsets, what are you talking about? I mean, and, and, and you just don't get that tone anymore. I mean, sure, what's happening in Washington um, is, is, is maybe an anomaly, but, but for me, the optimism is the fact that so, such a large percentage of business, of our elected officials, of local government leaders, and of the public seem to be on the same sheet of music now. I think a lot of us in this room can relate to that story. Nora? Um, I think for me, um, I think hope and inspiration comes from many different avenues. Um, I think for us working on issues like climate change, um, it's uh, sometimes a little bit depressing and daunting um, to think about the road ahead and, and what we have to do. Um, but, you know, I think hope and inspiration comes from little things um, like the, the youth climate strikes that happened and um, seeing so many young people um, think about um, this issue and think about future and think about taking to the streets is inspiring. Um, I think from a professional perspective on my day-to-day -day work, um, like I said, you know, we're sort of heads down. This is uh, this is something that I that is my full time job to do. Um, but then, when you kind of work with other partners within the company, our cross functional partners, whether you know they're working on something small and thinking about sustainability in what they're doing um, is inspiring. That you know it's not part of their job, um, but they're still thinking about it. It's also inspiring when it comes from our leaders who, again, it's the, you know, part of their day-to-day -day job is to think about the business. And, and when they're also integrating sustainability within it and thinking about the long-term vision um, for the company, that's inspiring. And that kind of makes you feel like, okay, we can make progress and, and you want to go on. So Jean-Christophe, Jean with your innovation hat on, what, what are you most excited about? What's inspiring you in 2019? I think what's inspiring me is the leapfrog in the scale of solutions. Um, to come back to the renewable um, electricity, the example I would quote is our first project was two megawatt, the latest one was 200 megawatt. So, because speed of change is so crucial to answer the speed of the climate change, these type of leapfrogs give me confidence. Right. Um, so I think we've only got time for one more question. Time flies. Um, I know I'm a little late to the party in this, but on the way over to Baltimore on the plane, I watched uh, the Anthropocene documentary and a number, and a number of things in it struck me. But in particular, the, the statement that they sort of landed on, which um, was, I, I'm probably paraphrasing a little, so I apologize. The tenacity and ingenuity that helped us humans thrive over the last 10,000 years will be exactly what will help us pull our natural systems back from the brink. Reimagining our present and future is the beginning of that change. So in that vein, I'd like to ask you all a bit of a, a blue sky question. Let's imagine that it's 20, 2050, 250, and we've stopped climate change in its tracks. I'll just take a moment to enjoy that thought. Um, what does the world look like, Nora? Um, it'll be great. <laughs> I won't have a job. <laughs> um, uh, I think the world, um, it, you know, just thinking about kind of what creates, uh, what creates greenhouse gas emissions and, and the sources of emissions, just thinking about PepsiCo and our footprint, um, a large part of it is, is agriculture. And so I think in a world um, where there's no emissions, where there's no greenhouse gases, I think the land sector will play a big role in it. Um, you know, th and it's also, um, you know, there are technologies that are already um, out there, they exist today. Um, it's just about scaling them up and getting them to a point where they're normal practice, um, normal business practice, normal 
you know, uh, community practice. Um, and so um, agriculture, I think, will play a big part where, um, you know, there's probably more sequestration, um, there's no deforestation, there's, you know, um, improvement in degraded lands. Um, there's also probably electric vehicles um, all around. Um, um, a lot of our energy coming from renewable sources. Um, so, it, you know, it's nothing new, I think. It's all out there already. Um, it's just that it'll become more common practice. Doug? I think using the old worn-out cliche that we, we're not looking for the silver bullet anymore. We just need lots of bullets, right? So, so if I envision 2050 and we were successful on climate change, that means that there were you know, hundreds or, or thousands of types of changes throughout the economy. But at the same time, I think by that point, you know, it, 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 it won't be real. I mean, it, it needs to be integrated into everything we do. So I, I almost see that it's, it's not such a topic of conversation by that point. If we've implemented these changes in transportation and, and energy and, and conservation, it's, it just becomes part of business as usual at that point. Nancy. Well, I think, uh, I think our cities will be cleaner and quieter. Um, I think, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, energy will be cheaper uh, and maybe almost, I don't know, free, um, as we've seen the prices of, of, uh, of the technology to capture renewable energy come down. Um, and as we've sort of applied sort of smart city type solutions, um, everybody will be, have the ability to be an energy producer as well as an energy consumer um, and do it in a way that um, helps them, helps their bottom line as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the, I know one of the big challenges to, to solving this, this crisis is really, really lies with cities as more and more people around the world uh, live in cities. Um, and so really focusing on what the city of the future looks like, a smart city, a clean city, um, and, um, you know, from, from my house, I can hear trains at night, the engines rumbling, they're a couple of miles away. I just think about an electric train, how much quieter um, that, that's going to be and how much healthier and um, more vibrant our cities will be. Sean so Christophe. First, thank you for bringing us in such a positive space. It feels very good to think of that first. Um, first, I would say that would be a world for me where both businesses and nations would manage their emissions as tightly or even better than their financials. Um, it's a world where the new technologies that we are developing and that will be developed by them will have created a lot of jobs so that the people that are currently threatened can thrive in, in those new... One of the, I know one of the big challenges to, to solving this, this crisis is really, really lies with cities as more and more people around the world uh, live in cities. Um, and so really focusing on what the city of the future looks like, a smart city, a clean city, um, and, um, you know, from... From my house, I can hear trains at night, the engines rumbling, they're a couple of miles away. I just think about an electric train, how much quieter um, that, that's going to be and how much healthier and um, more vibrant our cities will be. Sean so, Christophe. First, thank you for bringing us in such a positive space. It feels very good to think of that first. Um, first, I would say that would be a world for me where both businesses and nations would manage their emissions as tightly or even better than their financials. Um, it's a world where the new technologies that we are developing and that will be developed by them will have created a lot of jobs so that the people that are currently threatened can thrive in, in those new businesses, new business model, new technologies. And, and finally, back to where I started, I think of our children. And I would like this generation to, uh, that what this would allow them is to dream and to really be able to shape their future by dreaming versus being in the streets because they feel we'll hand over to them a world that will collapse. 
So my heart goes with them. That's what I want to offer them. I agree. Well, it all sounds great. I'm in. Let's, let's just do it. Let's do it. It starts here. Um, well, it has been such a pleasure spending time with the four of you this morning. Can you please join me in thanking our and celebrating with our uh, climate leadership winners? Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marsha Wills Karp. She is the Anna Bezier Distinguished Professor of Environmental Health and the Chair of the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Through her research, she has helped define the role that environmental determinants play in allergic airway diseases such as asthma. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wills Karp. Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure and privilege to be here today with you, and I'd like to thank the organizers, the C2EH Climate Registry and the Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, for allowing me to speak with you today. I'd also have to say that being in my little ivory tower in academia, it's been wonderful to see that there's so much going on in this space in businesses, and it's very encouraging and definitely leaves me with hope. So forgive me for a few minutes if I might dip down into some more depressing facts, but then hopefully I'll come back in a more hopeful note at the end. So we all know that greenhouse gases that are uh, triggering climate change affect, adversely affect the public's health. And these are coming from sources, industrial sources, automobiles, and others. They're causing global rises in temperature, those have induced ecological changes, such as fires, droughts, too much rainfall, hurricanes, other extreme weather events. And these are having a major impact on the health of the public. So the WHO estimates that in the years between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths. That's above all other causes of death. The direct, direct damage cost to healthcare and to the health of our public estimated be, to be between two and four billion dollars by 2030. And we, as public health practitioners, believe that this is the number one public health challenge of the 21st century and beyond. So where are those 250 deaths, 250,000 deaths? How are these people dying? Well, I'm showing you here on this graph on, on your left, uh, the number of deaths, this is just in the US between 2004 and 2013 from various extreme weather events. And these are direct deaths, drowning, electrocution, other things, from heat waves, tornadoes, hurricanes. You see in the middle column there that this comes at a fairly significant financial burden as well. $392 billion spent on just hurricanes alone. And although this is a global problem and the number of weather-related natural disasters has tripled since the 1960s, I've taken these pictures you're seeing here from the recent news events. The first one is the flooding that happened in the Midwest this week. You can see this entire town is basically underwater. In the bottom, there's the fallout from the tornadoes that hit across Alabama. So I want you to notice that the largest number of deaths here are from the heat waves themselves. So how do people die from heat? Well, it's a heat stroke. And although all of us are susceptible to this, potentially, it can happen to 20-year-olds, but generally the most vulnerable are our children, the elderly, and those who are already suffering with some diseases. I'm giving you a real-life example here on, on the left-hand side of your slide. I actually happened to be at a meeting in Chicago when this happened. 
This was 1995 in the summer. You can see in the middle panel there, the temperature went up to 105 degrees in this city that's not accustomed to that type of heat stress. And in that period, 700 people died in just a couple of days from the heat wave. A similar thing occurred in the summer of 2003 in Europe, but 70,000 people died from that heat wave. These are no trivial numbers. And it's projected that if we don't do something about this warming, that it will result in an increase of two to 10,000 deaths annually in each of our 209 largest US cities. And that's just talking about the US alone, not the rest of the world. So another way that heat and climate uh, temperature changes impact us is it fast tracks vector and waterborne diseases. Uh, warmer and hotter climates allow these um, vectors, such as mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas, to expand in number. But they're also here for longer. The season that they're around is longer. And because the heat is um, occurring in places where it's not normally so hot, this has also expanded the geographical distribution of these uh, organisms. And you may not be as familiar with some of these diseases, but malaria, which is spread by mosquitoes, kills 400,000 people every year. And it's estimated by 2050, half the world's population will be at risk of mosquito-borne diseases. It's malaria, as well as Zika, which most of you have heard of more recently, and dengue fever. And dengue has expanded tremendously over the last uh, 10 or 20 years. One, one thing you might not know is that the reason our government shuts down in August is because D.C. and Baltimore used to be a malaria hub. And that could happen again. One disease that most of you are probably more familiar about with is Lyme disease. It's very common in the northeast part of the U.S. If you see here from 1990 to current day, the cases of Lyme disease have increased substantially. And this is because the ticks that are carried by the deer are expanding in their season and the length of time that they're able to infect you. Another example of temperature effects on, on diseases is in those uh, organisms that are generally in water, salmonella and cholera. One of my colleagues did this study and they studied uh, 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 Lima, Peru during an El Nino year. And if you see in the circular area, you see there wasn't the normal dip in temperature. The temperature stayed extremely high during that El Nino year. And in that time period, there was a 200% increase in diarrheal diseases from things like cholera and salmonella. Air quality has been mentioned a lot at this conference, but there's many ways that air quality impacts uh, our health. First of all, greenhouse gases themselves cause excess respiratory and cardiovascular deaths. Huge numbers of people that die within 24 hours of a major smog event. There are also hospitalizations for asthma that go way up, and the scary part is we're learning that these are not the only things impacted by pollution. We're finding out that, that women give birth prematurely, that there's increased obesity, and autism is being connected to air pollution as well. If we're talking globally, this is 6.5 million people a year die from air pollution-related disorders. And this is a substantial uh, financial impact to the world as well, 82 billion just here in the US alone. So this is kind of an interesting phenomena that there are many things that are triggered by the heat. First, the ozone, which is triggered by sunlight and heat. This causes asthma attacks. The smoke from the wildfires out west and in different parts of the country trigger disease. But there's this phenomena shown on this graph. Those circles indicate the number of increased days in which pollen season lasts. And you can see up in Canada, there's 25 extra days of pollen. And if you're a hay fever sufferer, asthma, you know what the impact of that can be. And since there's 300 million people in the world that suffer from these diseases, this is a significant factor. There was a really strange phenomena that happened in Melbourne, Australia a, a couple of years ago. 
there was a really hot day over 100 degrees and it, it, there was a thunderstorm and the thunderstorm hits these pollen granules that were in the air because it was springtime there. It made these smaller granules and people could ingest, inhale them easier. 14,000 people had to go to the hospital on that single day in one city because of the pollen counts and the thunder interacting with them. And 10 people actually died. So there are indirect effects of, of climate change as well, and this is, we've talked a lot about flooding and other things. Flooding not only contaminates the freshwater supplies through all the toxic chemicals and oils and pollutants and sewage that are on the surface in the land washes into your water supply and overwhelms your water treatment uh, facilities. And so there's, there's heightened increase of these diseases that I told you about. The other thing that flooding does, and I ripped this from today's headlines actually, historic flood lo losses face Nebraska farmers will impact food on your table. So in the US we have more resilience. Losing crops in one part of the country will not probably lead to starvation. It will lead to increased food prices, but multiply this around the world when these floods are occurring and think about people who are just barely surviving. In Nebraska alone, this, the losses to the ranchers is 500 million. This is just from a couple days of flooding. And the grain loss is $400 million. So climate, the other extreme, when you don't have enough water in areas leads to droughts, as we know, there are crop failures. The people who were dependent on the income from those lose their incomes. There's food shortages. There leads to dehydration from lack of clean water, malnutrition, and famine. Three million people die of starvation and are going hungry every day. Now, thanks to efforts of the World Food Organization, uh, hunger had actually decreased. But unfortunately, in 2017, that number has risen again, and it's now eight, 815 million about 12 to 11 to 12 percent of people in the, in the world that are going hungry every day. Climate change multiplies those people who are already having difficulties with food security. And it's projected that 20 percent increase in hunger by 2050. So the other thing that's happening is the oceans are rising. And we're sitting here right close to the ocean. And when you look at the number of people around the world that live within uh, 30, 20 or 30 feet from the ocean, it's 800 million people are going to be displaced when the oceans basically take over the, these regions. If that happens in New York City, 20 foot rise, that will be 8 million people who will be displaced and have to find somewhere else to live. And eight, 11 of the 16 megacities around the world, Tokyo, LA, will be underwater. When these mass immigrations occur, it causes conflict, violence, poor living conditions, spread of diseases, and social and political instability. The traumas from these extreme weather events have led to sharp increases in people seeking out mental health um, uh, services from various hurricanes and floods, etc. If I haven't depressed you enough already, hopefully, there is hope. Change is happening, and I think you all being here and your messages are, are a beacon of hope. But I wanted to tell you just briefly about the Americans Pledge Initiative. Uh, in 2017, the UN Special uh, U UN Special Envoy for Climate Change Action, Mayor, former Mayor Michael Bloomberg, and former California Governor Jerry Brown launched this initiative, the American Pledge Initiative, after the US surprisingly and unthinkably uh, withdrew from the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. The goal of this initiative is to, uh, to excite, to record, to showcase your efforts as new drivers of leadership of the climate effort around the world. And over a very short time, 3,000 economic drivers in the US 
our drivers of the economy have pledged to support the Paris Agreement. So I think we need to applaud all of your efforts because I know you're among the 3,000 uh, in this room. And the economic ac activity from these coalition of the willing has already um, ch will potentially change up to 35% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. alone. Change is happening from the bottom up. I don't, it'd be great that the federal government were with us, but we can do it without them. And we are doing it without them. In 2017, the U.S. energy-related CO2 emissions fell to their lowest levels in 25 years. That's something to celebrate. We now have enough renewable energy to power 3 million homes for a year. It's amazing. And the current policies and things that you've been talking about here, along with market forces and technology, will change, um, hopefully change uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and be 17% below our 2005 levels. So you personally can get involved, and I, and I like the panelists. They were talking about what their corporations were doing, but they're also, we have social, personal responsibility. We all know that we can do, make changes to our transportation. We can adopt electric cars. The one I like, this, this fancy looking car there in the corner, is made out of hemp. And it runs on hemp. So it's a biorenewable fuel. So it's not a bad way, way to go in terms of uh, new transportation that's, that's uh, green. I'm going to skip that for time. The biggest thing we can all do is reduce our mink consumption. We haven't talked about it a lot here, but one-fourth of the greenhouse gas emissions come from cows in the supply chain, getting them to your table. So if we all adopt a plant-based uh, diet, it will both improve our health but also reduce emissions. And I just want a parting comment here is that Sid Lerner, who is an advertising executive in Madison uh, Avenue, came up with this slogan. How many of you have ever heard of it? Meatless Mondays. See? It's effective. They came up with this very simple, effective way of getting you to reduce your mink consumption at least one day a week. The, the thing about Monday, market research shows that we all change our habits on Monday, the first day of the week. So you make it about the first day of the week when you're, you're open to change. It's very simple, effective. I would employ you all, and I was talking to some of you earlier, champion your company's successes and communicate these simple messages to the world. And as some of the other speakers said earlier, please become a catalyst for a healthier world. And our slogan for our public health school is saving lives millions at a time. And I think you can all contribute to that. And as our other speakers said, we can't afford not to meet this challenge. We owe it to our children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wills Carp. Some of us may be going on a post-conference diet tomorrow. Our next and final panel will consist of climate storytellers who inspire, lessons from communication experts, something we can all benefit from. Our three climate storytellers all have experience in helping organizations communicate on climate change. Monica Trousey is a multi-talented communication strategist and TV host specializing in energy and environmental issues. She's the Senior Director of External Communications at the Nuclear Energy Institute. Roger Sorkin is an award-winning filmmaker specializing in the nexus between environment, energy, and natural security. Bernadette Woods Plackey is an Emmy Award-winning meteorologist and Director of Climate Central's Climate Matters Program. Please welcome our panel.
Thank you for that introduction and thank you all. Thank you uh, C2ES for the opportunity to talk on what I think is an incredibly important topic. I think what we do as communicators is sometimes overlooked, but I think it is an essential part of um, advancing um, any kind of climate solution or climate policy. Um, it just so happens that the three of us all really love video. Um, that is not the only medium uh, through which we can communicate about climate, but I think we've all found uh, a passion um, and success in video. So we are gonna share with you today um, some short video clips that um, have been successful in getting some messages out. Um, but we're also gonna talk through kind of um, what we've seen uh, in, in our work and what we see in the future um, for climate storytelling um, and how you all might be able to get involved in that. And we'll also leave some time um, for Q&A from the audience as well. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons why we all lean in to video um, is because the research shows that video is um, one of the most successful ways to get decision makers to move in a certain direction. 80% um, of decision makers who view a video on a topic are likely to uh, make a decision based off of that video. Um, so when you have stats like that, uh, you kind of want to put videos in front of people who are making decisions. Um, so I've been working in the video space for uh, for 15, about 15 years, um, and I started as a journalist, and so what I was doing with video um, as a journalist was a little different than what I'm doing now, um, but regardless, um, always on climate and energy issues, and what I found is that um, not only can you educate, but you can really involve audiences while using video as a communication tool. Um, and so when I worked at e, &E News uh, for just about 12 years, and I remember interviewing you, Roger, uh, several years ago, um, we were really kind of leading the, the conversation um, that was happening on climate and energy policy in the country. Um, and so very often the conversation that was happening on our show at E&E &E would then show up in congressional testimony a few weeks later or at a conference like this. Um, and so I, I took that experience and have now pivoted to uh, more of an advocacy uh, space um, at the Nuclear Energy Institute. Um, and so when I started at NEI, I kind of was given this blank slate to, um, to launch some type of video product that would engage audiences um, and kind of lean into clean energy conversations and climate conversations. And so uh, my colleague Tara Young and I um, came up with this idea to sit at restaurants with um, leaders in the energy and climate space and have conversations. And Bob, you were um, one of my first guests on the series. Um, and so what we found is that people really like to watch others sitting and talking at restaurants, um, and surprise, um, and hey, we just happen to be talking about something really important, um, but we're also feeding our messaging um, into those conversations as well. Um, and so we um, have hundreds of thousands of views on, on the series and we um, have found that we're able to engage with audiences that normally would not watch a conversation about energy policy um, or climate change um, because of how we've set it up, because it's casual, because we're sitting and talking. Um, and so I just wanted to show a clip, a couple of clips from um, a few episodes, about two minutes of video. Hey. How are you? Well, it's so good to see you. Glad we can catch up today. Hope you haven't been waiting Not long. too long. In a town that loves power lunching, it's always about who you're with and where you're going. Oh, I love it here. I'm talking to the leading minds on energy and giving you a taste of DC. I'm just staring at all the really yummy yeah. treats. I'm Monica Trousey, and this is Off the Menu. States sort of 
at these points of needing to make decisions mm -hmm. on how to move forward um, with their own clean energy policies. Um, so what's kind of that formula that you think is the sweet spot for states to be hitting? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that you can find a one size fits all yeah. because you have such a different, I mean, states pick the resources they picked in large part because of the industries that they wanted to attract. Uh, the resources they had in other parts of their portfolio. It, if you look at the coal-fired generation base in the Midwest, when you think about the low cost of coal and the need for industrial power supply to be running constantly so that factories could generate process lines and, and run and run and run and run. In the Southeast, nuclear power where you didn't have a lot of wind, a clean resource, yeah, it made sense. So these are very individualized, state utility commission controlled, parochial decisions. I think it starts at the state level, quite frankly. And I think we see the state regulators doing their part in some very challenging and risky um, projects and industry doing theirs. Figuring out what the future should look like and then making the decisions and investments. Consumers are paying for that to make sure that we get there. The conversation still really focuses and centers around renewables, yeah. um, uh, but it, it could go beyond that. So how do you sort of convince the business community that it's not just about renewables and to sort of expand that definition of what clean energy is? We have a substantial amount of decarbonized electricity already. We, we do have uh, hydropower, we have growing renewables, but we also have a nuclear power, let's say 20% of our electricity. So you have between nuclear, hydropower, and the, the newer renewables like wind and, and solar, we are we're up in near 30, maybe a little more than 30% of our electricity right now is carbon free. So by using video as an advocacy tool, um, we've been able to um, have conversations with folks who um, we wouldn't typically be having conversations with um, and engaging audiences, new audiences. Um, and so we will continue with this series. Um, it's currently in production. We're airing a new episode um, next Wednesday. Um, and it's been exciting to be a part of and kind of um, try something new uh, to message on climate. I want to turn the floor over to Roger now to talk about the work that you're doing. Thank you, Monica. Good morning. Uh, I am the executive director of the American Resilience Project, and we use film as a tool. Uh, it's a tool for convening, um, and we think of our work as strategic narratives. It's not so much that we're telling stories. I mean, stories flow from the strategic narrative that you're building your efforts upon. Um, and the definition of a strategic narrative, it's very simple. Uh, it is a story that everyone, and I mean everyone, can understand and identify with in their own lives. And that, that last phrase, in their own lives, is a really critical part of it. And uh, I hate to pick on the Green New Deal again, since we've been picking on it, but it, I think it deserves to, uh, to be criticized. It is not a strategic narrative. It's not because it doesn't identify with all Americans. Not every American can identify with this bold proclamation. And just by having a bold proclamation, you don't necessarily have a strategic narrative. And when we think about what is the, the narrative designed to do, it's designed to mobilize. And when we look back at some of the most effective mobilization efforts we've had in recent history, we've had World War II. Um, we had a great national effort across party lines, and we had Republicans who hated Roosevelt that were uh, falling in line. We had corporations that were coming to step up and, and uh, help that war effort. Um, went to the moon. Arguably, there was no existential threat by not going to the moon. Um, there was no real national security threat that was posed by not going to the moon, yet we did it, and we unified the country around an effort. Uh, we, we created a lot of great technology as a result of that effort. Um, we created a lot of jobs, and we accomplished the goal, and it made us all feel really good, and I suppose some of the national security folks could say that there was a national security payoff by being the first country to go to the moon. Um, and so the, the way I think about my work is it's designed to unify um, and not necessarily kind of fight a political battle. So I, I, again, I come back to that Green New Deal because I think it's really, uh, the ambition is great, um, but it's not something that we should use as our foundation. And so the foundation that I like to think about is grid modernization. And when we think about modernizing the grid, 
we're, if we can do it successfully, we'll accomplish a lot of the goals that the Green New Deal has uh, set out to do. Um, we unite the utilities, auto, tech, defense, engineering sectors. We show that there's economic opportunity and we clean up the air and improve public health. And I think at the end of the day, when we talk about climate communications, we have to sort of take the sentimentality out of it um, and even maybe a little bit of arrogance out of it in that we have what it takes to actually save a planet. Um, the planet will do with us what it wants to do with us, despite what we do. Um, we need to save human habitat. We need to preserve civilizational stability. Um, and at the end of the day, really what that's all about, it's coming back to the story that everyone can understand, saving our families, saving our homes. Those are the, if you can remember two things, that's what people care about. Um, I think everyone in this room knows that the polar bear argument is not the one that's gonna win over people from across the political divide. Um, but people care about their families, their homes, and the energy required to sustain the lifestyles that we have. Um, so I'm gonna show you a trailer from our new film. It's called Current Revolution, and it's designed as the first in a series that um, I would say it's uh, probably the first story in the narrative that we're putting out there, that grid modernization is the path to solving our climate problems. Uh, so we can cue that up. Uh, For those people in the fossil fuel industry, it is a simple truth that your business is going to go away. It's just a matter of figuring out how to do that without leaving people behind or destabilizing the system. There's nine points of failure in the United States. You take any one of those out, then you could have partial grid collapse. And many of our bases are at the end of the power line. We don't want to lose these military bases. One of the questions they're going to be asking is, does the base have its own power? There's virtually no one that is opposed to solar. Now that differs from our elected officials going against their constituents. In six states across the country, power companies are fighting to change the rules. We understand that their bottom line is investment. They've got to turn a profit. There's an energy revolution going on. Shouldn't I have the freedom to put solar panels up on my roof if I want? Should there really be a utility telling me, no, you can't do that? If they keep trying to push that, more and more people are just gonna disconnect from the grid. I want the power company at the table when it comes to developing solar and EVs because they have the money, they have the infrastructure. Put it on a moral foundation. Everyone has a right to clean water, to toxic free air. I believe that God created this world and put that sun out there, in my opinion, for us to take advantage of. This is the civil rights issue of our time. To take care and protect my creation. We will stand as one united force. We will not bend, we will not break, and we will not bow down. So uh, this film is actually having its DC premiere tomorrow, just a quick plug, uh, at the DC Environmental Film Festival. Um, you can find me afterwards, I can give you more information if you'd like to come and see it. But I just wanna say one more thing, and that is, as you go out there, you know, and, and you know, what Monica said about um, you know, using video as a way to persuade people, I think the, the convening power of it is, is really key. And so when you, when you it's not enough just to have a screening. You have to think about who's in the room, and then more importantly, who's gonna be sitting up here when the lights come on to have and lead that discussion. And that's where you really have to have your trusted messengers. You know, With all due respect, I mean, you can't have Al Gore uh, anymore. I mean, we sort of hit the ceiling on his, his ability to move the needle. Um, I think we're, we're really trying to, to unify a wider section of the country. Uh, you gotta think about folks that you're trying to persuade who are the people they trust, who are the people that, that are going to, to move them. And you'll see in this, in this trailer, uh, it's a pretty conservative-leaning series of messengers uh, because we're really trying to reach a, a center-right audience. We're trying to reach conservative states, uh, not pander to them, but reflect their values in the stories that we're telling. Uh, so uh, thanks. I'll turn it over to Bernadette.
Thanks. <clears throat> so I'm really excited to be here today. It's my first time at this conference, and most of my time when I was on air was in Baltimore, so it's coming home, so it's pretty nice. Um, I have a slightly different approach than my other two colleagues here in that it is via video what I'm going to show you, but really what I'm trying to talk about is having a conversation with your public. And Trusted Messengers comes back to a lot of what I'm doing right now. Climate Central, for those who don't know, we're a nonprofit, an NGO, non-advocacy, based out of Princeton. We're researching and reporting on climate change. We're really trying to advance this conversation from is it or is it not happening that we've been caught up in for so long and has been solved decades ago to what does it mean to you? What does it mean to your family, your community? What can be done about it? And as soon as we get there, there's a whole host of conversations that we can have and really rich storytelling to be told. So I'm going to start with this video and then I'll expand a little bit more. There's an unmistakable trend here. No matter what snow we get, it will melt faster than years past. climate change and more warm air making its way with moisture and causing bigger storms. Above normal days during springtime has nearly doubled. It in particular has seen a 55% change. Y sobre el área de Denver que la temperatura lentamente For every 1 degree increase the air can hold 4% more water vapor. An increase in these hot days in the summer. The line gradually increasing. Part of our warming climate where the summers are getting warmer. The increase in the number of smoky days that are expected can lead to higher pollen levels. The change in pattern of diseases spread by insects such as mosquitoes. Those turbines, we also create a lot of job opportunities. Churches, synagogues, all across the country are now enjoying the benefits of tapping into the sun. La energía solar, eso evita la contaminación. From Climate Central. Our partners at Climate Central, our friends over at Climate Central. The global warming is not fake news, folks. Incredible what's going on right now on Earth. Changing our climate, and that's why it matters. So this program, Climate Matters, which started in 2010 with Jim Gandy, one of the last TV meteorologists you saw there in Columbia, South Carolina, that was one guy. And it has now expanded to work with more than 650 TV meteorologists across the country and a host of people internationally also, but I'm going to focus on the U.S. today. Um, weather is how most people experience climate change. Extreme weather has been covered multiple times already just this morning. It smacks you in the face. It's life-changing. It's life-focusing. The other thing, though, just our everyday weather has changed. So what we try to do is bring this storyline in where and when appropriate. When there's an extreme weather event that does have a climate change tie, we try to get this information ahead of time to our TV meteorologists so they can tell that story. Also, we try to connect with topics at different times of year. Not all of, I mean, it's a heavy subject, we know that, but we try to have fun sometimes too. For example, today's World Water Day. So, there's a lot of opportunities to tell a story about water and what can be done going forward. Also, I mean, for example, we used Star Wars Day one time and how our planet's atmosphere really drives our climate. So we try to use these moments, not just topics, but when we time those topics to connect where people, where they are with situations that'll resonate with them. I mean, we know this is a topic that is really heavy. The solutions really do offer hope, and we can get into that in a little bit here too. But sometimes people just take this topic like it's this monster in the corner, and they don't know how to get to it, and they don't know how to talk about this. 
I really just want people to start talking about it in ways that matter, and that's what we're trying to do with this program. So the other thing with TV meteorologists that's been really unique is it's not just the direct connection with weather, but they have this direct conversation with their audience time and time again. So they have that opportunity to advance this conversation. And in some cases, they're the only scientists that the public ever really interacts with. So that's why we've been able to really take this program and try and advance it in those ways. As I said, we're trying to take a large issue that is so multifaceted and break it down into these storylines that will resonate with people. And so I know we're going to talk about some of our lessons learned from everything that we've done because We've talked about some video and some different ways of communication, but not everybody has video production, and not every, and we don't want to scare you off from talking about that, thinking you need to have that high level to, to get into that conversation. There's a lot of things that the three of us have learned along the way that we think will apply to what you guys are doing too. So thank you. Yes, very good point about video. It's very expensive to produce. So. <laughs> yeah. You do have to have a budget for it. Um, I'm curious, because the topics that we're all talking about are really meaty um, and in some circles controversial, right? Um, what, what pushback have you gotten for the work that you've done? Um, do you get pushback? Do you kind of hear um, naysayers kind of um, questioning what you're doing? Um, I don't uh, because I'm, I try to be mindful and anticipate what that pushback would be. Uh, we don't get into the debate over what's causing climate change. We get into the debate over, do you want your state to charge you more for the energy that you use? Because renewables are cheaper now. Um, so we just anticipate what is it that's going to really affect uh, most consumers, ratepayers. I mean, it's not a term I like to boil everybody down to just, uh, you know, your identity as a ratepayer, but uh, it's definitely uh, the economics of it. I think if we can stick, I mean, fortunately now, because renewables are cheaper, it's easier to have that argument. If, it, if you know, a few years ago, it, it was more of an investment uh, that you had to make the case for some ROI in the future, um, that was a harder conversation to have. But, but right now, I mean, you, I mean, you look at a place like Arizona, uh, they're one of the states that we profile in this new film. We look at Arizona and Georgia for the work that their public service commissions are doing there. They're all Republican commissions. They're both elected. Um, yet those commissions, Georgia has definitely been more out front on this. They have a uh, great deal of solar. They've teamed up with the military to put utility scale solar on the basis there. It's a really great example of a public-private partnership uh, between the federal government, the uh, power company there, Georgia Power, uh, and of course the regulators get to take credit for a really good deal that lowers everybody's rates without subsidies because it would have never passed if the state had to subsidize it. Um, Arizona, in the film, which came out a couple of months ago, shows, it doesn't mention it by name because we're, we're trying not to demonize anyone by name, we're, we're sort of trying to give a, a little bit of tough love to say, hey look, don't you want to be more like Georgia? Um, Arizona Public Service had been fighting rooftop solar and net metering. Uh, and just recently, I think just a couple of weeks ago, they uh, invested in 850 megawatts of solar plus storage. And they didn't do it for any other reason because other than that it is cheaper. Um, and so we have the economics on our side. So anytime you feel like you're getting pushback, um, just bring the conversation back to the economics. Well, of course, we get some pushback. But the thing is, though, when I was on TV, I got more pushback on your outfit or your hair or something like that than in science I would talk about. And TV meteorologists in general are a very attacked profession, so they're used to that. Um, and yeah, you're all giggling because, <laughs> yes, the similar comments that always come up. But so they're used to handling the public. And one of the things we do in a lot of our workshops is you know, focusing on the public opinion in two different ways. One, that we know it's trending up and that over 7% of the population is convinced this is happening. They're not the ones reaching out to you all the time with feedback, but they're the ones that know something's happening, but not quite what's happening and what that means to them yet. So there's this huge opportunity because people aren't talking about this enough. So that's one thing, but the other thing is, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Six Americas research, my colleague Ed Maybach who works on this project with me does at George Mason University, breaking down public opinion into six different sectors. And the ones that have the loudest voice and that aren't going to change are down to only 9% of the population. So you're speaking to the other 90%, even though that 9% may come at you on social media, 
you're really trying to fill the void and answer the questions that people have them, and they come back with questions occasionally too. So we focus on that. Um, you know, I uh, obviously I'm biased, but I, I do feel that what we do as communicators is uh, critical to um, to advancing um, any kind of uh, policy or um, or thinking, new way of thinking. Um, you know, to push it forward. Um, we obviously have a room full of experts. What do you all think the folks in this room maybe don't know about climate communication? Well, fear doesn't work. Um, I think probably most of you, you get that, but uh, you know, scaring people just doesn't work. I mean, it, it might work for certain organizations. The NRA could probably uh, boost gun sales by scaring us that we're all going to get, you know, shot by somebody. Um, I mean, it, it, it can work, but it doesn't work to bring people together. And this is, as I talked about earlier, a mobilization that requires a lot of cross-sector collaboration. And you have to show that uh, the utilities, the auto, tech, defense, engineering sectors, all of whom rely, I mean, we all rely, our, our human behavior, our, our society, we all rely increasingly so on a functioning, you know, uninterrupted supply of electricity. Um, and I think we're, we're a lot more vulnerable by the day because we depend on it so much uh, for everything from you know, pumping the gas to go into the generators that people think, oh, I got a generator, I'll be okay when the lights go out. No. Uh, you won't because you got to get to the gas station and they don't have electricity. Um, so I think you got to show the opportunity. It's just keep coming back to that. There is, and, and I guess I'm a little bit cynical. Um, my, my view of human nature is that people are not going to do anything unless it's, if they can't connect it to their self-interest. Um, again, it's families and homes. Um, so bring it back to the self-interest. Stay away from the sentimentality of it. Stop with the polar bears. And uh, I think we'll, we'll be more effective in our communications. You don't like polar bears, huh? I love them. <laughs> I'm, I'm resigned to, you know, let, I mean, yeah, I got nothing against polar bears, but it's just not a great communications tool. <laughs> so a couple of things, and I'm sure many of you know this in some capacity, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about best practices of lessons learned along the way is, the first thing in communication is knowing your audience. And that sounds so broad to some people, but to really break it down is know what topics connect with them. Know timing of topics that connect with them and know the level you're talking to. And I don't mean that as dumbing down because it really frustrates me when people say that. It takes real skill to be able to explain a complicated subject on a basic level. So I think you have to know your audience across the spectrum and you connect with them. That's the first thing you want to do. You want to meet your audience where they are to start this conversation. The second thing that we really focus on is storytelling. And for some of you that may apply to what you're doing, if storytelling can't come out in some of what you're doing, you could really look at that as having a conversation, not a lecture, but having that conversation with someone. What are their questions? How can you help fill those voids and those gaps? So that's that's another thing I really wanted to hit. Something that came up today, so I took note of it, was talking a lot about uncertainty, 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 uncertainty. I am a scientist. I get the uncertainty completely, but there's a lot that is certain. There's a lot that we do know. And I would like people to focus on that too, because you know, start with the things you do know. You may not know the exact amount of rain, the exact year, what it's going to look like, but you know it's going up. So you know you have to do something about it. So focus on the certainty. This is something in the meteorology world we talk about all the time with forecasting. For example, people have deemed that cone around a hurricane a cone of uncertainty, where in fact it's a cone of certainty. It's we know the hurricane is going in that direction. So focus on the certainty. And then you can frame it around risk from there. But that is something I really wanted to draw out. Also, talk about, don't be afraid to talk about certain things. Because it is such a complex subject matter, that doesn't mean avoid it or take it as, oh my gosh, how do I come at this thing? Whatever you learn, start your conversation there. Whatever you feel comfortable with, sorry. <laughs> start your conversation. Don't be afraid to take it on. And don't be afraid to talk about what you don't know either, not focusing on the uncertainty all the time, but just have that conversation with people. So that's what I really wanted to stress. And I think messaging repetition as well is incredibly important. I think sometimes we think 
we're saying something over and over, and so the audience must be bored by it, but chances are the audience never heard you the first five times you said it. Marketing um, 101. <laughs> so you just have to keep repeat whatever, narrowing your message um, to that, that core piece. You know, what is it that you're truly trying to tell your audience? And then repeating it over and over and over and finding different ways to repeat it, right? Maybe it's through video, maybe it's through social media, um, maybe some infographics that will help deliver that, repeat it over and over and over. That's what Ed Maybach often says too, simple messages repeated often by trusted messengers. Yep. And then he says it again and again mm -hmm. and again and again. So to yep. the point. And just to build on that, I think you should also be identifying what is the call to action. And there's never going to be a one-size-fits-all. And you know, the call to action might just be in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It could be to a large audience. Um, you know, in the case of, uh, let's say, Arizona again, people have $400 electric bills in the summertime. Um, their air conditioning bills are, are literally through the roof. Um, they know that solar's cheaper, so they're moving in that direction. So when you go to Arizona, and, and that, that community, by the way, that's profiled in this film is Pebble Creek, Arizona. The reason why we went there is because it's one of the most conservative uh, places in the country based on their, their voting results. I think about 65% of uh, the people are registered Republicans, and you see that that's sort of how the uh, election broke down last time in 2016. Uh, yet, 30% of the homes there now have solar on the roof. And again, it's because it's a, it's a pocketbook, pocketbook issue. Um, the other thing about not being afraid to have that conversation, you know, there's this taboo about, oh, you don't talk politics at Thanksgiving dinner. And, you know, that, that's, I, I think that we have to flip that. Yes, you should not talk about politics at Thanksgiving dinner with your conservative uncle by leading with, I saw Al Gore's movie the other day, and it made me want to go out and buy a Prius. Uncle Frank, you should do that. You know that's, that, how that's going to end. Um, but you can begin the conversation with, hey, how much did you spend on oil? Or, you know, that, I like your truck, but how much did you spend on that? Well, you know, my neighbor just got this car. Um, she doesn't pay anything for oil. I mean, you know, there's lots of ways into the conversation. And if the call to action to Uncle Frank is, it might just be something as simple as consider something new. I mean, that's, that's the, the least you could hope for. Um, but uh, understand what that action is and understand that in every community it might be slightly different. You know, 10, 15 years ago, um, we weren't hearing meteorologists talk about climate change on TV. Um, a film like the one you've produced probably wouldn't be produced. Um, when I was a journalist, we were covering the debate on climate change, whether it was happening, and um, I, I think the naysayers had a very, very strong um, voice. Uh, things have evolved since then. Where do you guys see kind of climate storytelling and climate communication evolving next? What's the future of it? Oh, um, I think this is getting me to the points of hope. Uh, it, it's, it's focusing on the things I already talked about, of, of really just getting that conversation to the next level. Because once we get there, we have a more informed society. I mean, people have these questions, and they're looking for answers. And they don't know where to find those answers, because people aren't talking about this enough in these trusted spaces. You Google something online, we know where that's going to go. So it's, it's having these central sources to answer questions. Because I would argue that the 70-some percent who's convinced, that number would be higher, and people would be more concerned. So I think it's advancing this conversation where it needs to go. But to what gives me hope in doing that is all of you, is what happened last Friday with the climate strikes, is that these conversations that I'm having with media that did not happen before are happening. Now, again, we've come a long way. We have a long way to go because we need to stabilize our climate. It's not just having the conversation. But we're doing it. Again, if you come from the science space, you understand how that needed to be done decades ago, so you, you get a little anxious, but it is happening, and that's what gives me hope, and I think it, just putting that, doubling that down into efforts to keep that going and ramping up the speed of that. Yeah, I, I am hopeful, again, because maybe this is a little too cynical, but because the numbers are on our side, and it's just such a great case to make. It's almost a no-brainer. I mean, there's a lot of noise to cut through, um, our media landscape is very polarized, tribalized. Um, 
you know, even if, you know, we got on Rachel Maddow tonight, it's not sure that we would move the needle much on this um, because the folks we're trying to reach are probably not watching that. Um, but I think knowing, and it, I guess it comes back to civic engagement. You don't have to mobilize mass audiences. You can go right to certain elected officials. Uh, you can go find out your, I mean, I, I say that the Public Service Commission in whatever state you're in is the most important government agency you never heard of. Of course, you all have heard of what a Public Service Commission is, but you know, the, the average voter, they're, you know, if we can get them to even turn out, they might know their, their, uh, their congressional delegation they're voting for, um, they might know a big ballot measure that's on, on, on the ballot that particular cycle, um, but you, know, you get down ballot and you see Public Service Commissioner, and I think a lot of people, and for me until recently, would just say, oh gosh, I don't know who these people are, I guess I'll just vote party line. Um, in a state like Georgia, when they're all Republicans, some are more pro-solar than others. Uh, so it, it's incumbent upon people to really do, the, do a little bit of research, find out who your allies are, are, and then go, and this is where I think this room is really critical, go to the private sector. Because we all know, whether you like it or not, the private sector has a lot of influence over how policy gets made. And I, I've been hearing this theme at the conference this week, that, that corporate America needs to lean into policy. I think I've heard that phrase a couple of times, and I think that's exactly right. Um, so you know that your supply chains are going to be disrupted if you can't rely on the physical and, and, and cyber security of the grid. Um, you can put it into those terms. So, you know, your, your rate payers just as well. Amazon and, and large companies that think about relocating and building new facilities, they want to know what's the energy landscape in this state. That's a big consideration for companies. Uh, so you can put pressure on public service commissions. Uh, and again, as citizens, grab your neighbors and go down to the Public Service Commission and, and fill up those seats, which are almost always empty at those hearings, and uh, show them that you're paying attention. And um, I think that that's what gives me hope, is that we have the capacity for that civic engagement with the numbers on our side. With corporate, one more thing with corporations too, though, and this is where you, I'm sure you know, have this voice, but one thing I've been talking to some of the public about too is it's not just the influence on the policymakers, but the public. The public is starting, well, not starting to, is, is really trending in the direction of buying based on what corporations are doing and what policies they themselves are implementing, as we know. So even if it hasn't fully reached a federal level, that, that's, that's where this conversation is going. This is where public interest is. Yeah, and whereas the debate 10 years ago was on whether climate change was happening, now the conversation is an acknowledgement that it's happening, but a debate over what to do, what sources of energy you know, to keep on the table, or is it every source of energy? Um, what are the state policies that need to be in play? What are the clean energy standards? Um, you know, and, and a lot of that is not necessarily things that consumers are connecting with or aware of, but as communicators, we need to figure out ways to um, advance along with, um, with the conversation and really lead it. Um, and, and I challenge you all to think that through as well as you are figuring out how you want to communicate on next steps, right? What's the future of how we're solving this, this big problem um, and how to pinpoint those really sharp messages um, to get after what it is that, that you're hoping for. One more point on that too that's really interesting I've seen work is the unique partnerships. As you're saying, if you want to break through new molds, partner with new people. Think outside the box. Someone else that will bring someone into the conversation, it's going to benefit your business too, but it's also going to benefit the conversation because new people will be attuned to it. So I really challenge for new partnerships and unique ones. Religious community. Sports. No one wants to see the same. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Al Gore. I won't hate on him as much as you did, but... I love Al um, Gore. Uh, no one wants to see the same people, the same messengers, over and over and over again, right? Um, they, they get it, right? That person believes that climate change is happening. So it's always about freshening the message, um, keeping the message clear and concise, but always making sure that there's a freshness to it. What inspires you guys? Well, you know, I, I talked about not, <laughs> not uh, acting out of fear, uh, or at least using fear as a communications tool, but I think if I have to confess, it is a sort of a fear of what, you know, and again, it's not about the planet, it's a fear of 
what is the future of civilization? I mean, it is a, it, it's not a given that civilization will always be stable. We've seen throughout history the rise and fall of many civilizations. Um, so I like human society. I, uh, I, I like to see it continue. I, I certainly want my children and future generations to be able to enjoy all the things that I enjoy. It's selfish. Um, again, I, I, I sort of check my sentimentality about the planet, uh, which I do love. Um, I'm grateful that I live on it. But it, it's really about keeping this, uh, this, this human, this thriving human society going uh, and, and in continuing to enlighten it. I think what inspires me is that this is the biggest challenge of our time, but we know how to fix it. So let's do it. I am energized by um, how dramatically the conversation has shifted on climate change in the last 10 years. Um, and that um, compels me to um, continue to drive forward and, um, and share new messages um, and try to reach new outcomes um, on clean energy and climate. We wanted to leave a little time to take questions from the audience. Um, does anyone have any questions in the audience? Hi. It's hard for us to see. <laughs> Hi, I'm Maria with LA Water and Power. So I was just curious if you think that there should be a separate messaging for disadvantaged communities, for example, whose, um, you know, 100% of their energy, of course, is looking to provide food for their families or finding that next job. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. I think it always goes back to knowing who your audience is. I think very often um, when I uh, speak to folks who I'm consulting with um, and I ask who's your audience, then they say, well, everyone, everyone's their audience, right? So you've already identified who the audience is. So yes, there should be um, messaging that's specific to that audience's needs. Um, and I think uh, with low-income communities specifically, um, what I have seen works is um, working through church groups um, sure. and really going into the local communities on the local level. Um, that seems to be successful, but you kind of have to refine what the messaging is that you want to share um, through those groups. Yeah, there's a lot of talk of just transitions. There was a panel on it uh, the other day. And I think that's a, a series that we're also trying to develop to try to show what different communities are doing to move beyond, well, let's say, the coal-fired power plant that not only had jobs for people, but kind of had their their uh, rates. I mean, I'm, I'm no energy policy expert, but I imagine that when you shift from one to the next, there might be a little hiccup in the middle, and people might need a little bit of help to, uh, to get through that transition. So I think... Um, Talking about environmental justice, again, yes, absolutely engaging faith communities, uh, local leaders. Uh, that's a great way to also get people civically engaged. I agree. <laughs> Are there any other hands in the audience? I can't see. You know, obviously these issues are highly politicized. You, um, how do you kind of... Uh, handle those challenges? Do you face that? Um, you know, we, we, again, we anticipate it. Yeah. Um, it's why you, you, you won't see anyone in, in this particular film that has a D after their name. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if there was a Democrat that we knew was regarded, I mean, let's say by some strange chance, Joe Manchin suddenly uh, was ready to go to his constituents in West Virginia and say, you know, I'm ready to, to embrace this full on and, and really take on the coal industry in my state. Good luck with that, I know. Um, then we probably would, would feature him because he is a trusted messenger in West Virginia. Um, he keeps getting reelected there. So, you know, but we, we go for people that are the, the trusted messenger that people can't quibble with. And I, I think that's the key to, to messaging. You, you, you have to trust the messenger. And as you said about freshening up who you, you present, um, 
that's, that's really key and make sure, and that, and that requires doing a little bit of work to get out, out of your comfort zone. I mean, you know, I spent the day with Bubba McDonald. Uh, he's, a, you know, died in the wool conservative. He's proud of his political views. We didn't really talk about other things political. He, he was a big Trump supporter, I'm not. Um, we didn't talk about that. You know, you know the things that you can, you can talk about. There's always gonna be something to unify. Uh, despite what some of the uh, kind of political punditry chatter is that you hear out there. Uh, the, and, and it's our job to find it. At the end of the day, we're all human beings. So you connect with people. There's lots that connects us still. So if I focus on that. For our organization, we are a non-policy group. We focus on science. So, yeah. I mean, the science is on our side, so. I mean, obviously a lot of what we focus on at NEI is uh, policy and, and politics, um, but I agree with you that there are always things that, that we can find that people agree on, um, and that kind of keeps propelling us forward on, on the communication side. Thank you um, to my colleagues for, for joining me today. This was a great conversation. Thank and you. And thanks for staying with us till the end, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great panel. And as a former Illinois utility regulator who worked on grid modernization and nuclear issues, I just want to point out only about 11 states have elected commissions, and they're mainly in the South and the West. I want to thank everyone for coming to the conference, thank the C2ES and Climate Registry staff who put in a lot of work making this happen. I hope a lot of you... I hope a lot of you will take advantage of the tours of the Exelon plant, Camden Yards, and the Healthy Harbor walking tour if it isn't raining. I want to point out that the umbrellas many of you received have paw prints on the underside. I think they're panda or polar bears. There's a story behind that. And please check out a lot of the materials on our website and the social media at Pound CLC. And remember your discount at the aquarium also. Thanks, Ann. Let me thank you as well as all the staff and for the work that you've done to get this conference together. Um, Bloomberg and, and the staff, um, and really, very importantly, all of you in the audience. As I mentioned when we started, um, conferences um, are as good as everybody who participates in it makes it. You know, we can put the stuff together, but having your participation and the mix of ideas that all of you have brought in the last couple of days and the experiences you've brought to the table have made the conference much more robust and vibrant, and I really appreciate it, and I've learned a lot. You know, the word conference comes from the word confer, and the word, the definition of confer is to compare views and take counsel. And so... I suggested at the beginning that all of you try to learn, try to share, and then in so doing, uh, leave inspired. And, and I feel inspired, and I always get inspired at these climate leadership conferences. This is our eighth one. It's been great. It's been great being here in Baltimore. So I hope all of you will um, uh, come again next year. We don't know where it's going to be yet. We go through some mystical process to figure that out. Um, I, I don't know, I like Baltimore. But anyway, um, thanks everyone for coming. Have safe travels. Enjoy the trips this, and the tours this afternoon if you go on them. And uh, we'll see you next year. Thank you. Yeah.